Today's guest, we got two-time World Series champion for the New York Yankees. It's Jim Laritz. Jim, thank you for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me, Tanner. I'm, you know, as you can see, I'm repping the Yankee jersey right now. I had to. I, I went in my closet and, like, just destroyed it trying to find my Yankee jersey. So I had to rep it when I have a World Series champion on the, on the podcast. There you go. There you go. I like it. I like it. Thank you, Jim. So you played at the University of Kentucky. As of late, there's been a lot of alumni, a lot of great players have come through there. We have James Paxton, uh, John, uh, Jason Kipnis, Brendan Webb, Joe Blanton, Scott Downs, and yourself. What made you want to go play for the University of Kentucky? Well, you know, it, it started out, out of high school. Uh, out of high school, I was supposed to be a number one draft pick. Um, and of, of all teams, the Atlanta Braves. Oh. And uh, four days before the draft, they called my father to let them know that they were going to make me a draft pick and would I be interested in signing? Because back then, you know, they didn't want to waste picks on kids that wanted to go to college. Right. And my dad said, well, listen, make him an offer and uh, we'll discuss it. And I came home that afternoon with a fractured foot from playing tennis. Oh, my God. Yes. And my dad said, oh, my God, I got to tell them now you got this broken foot. Long story short, they didn't draft me. They didn't want to waste a pick because I had a broken foot but I was going to be able to come back and play at the end of the summer. So they came back and watched me play at the end of the summer. And they said, listen, what would it take to sign him? We want to offer him a free agent contract. My dad said, give him $10,000. And the Braves said, we can only give him five. And my dad said, screw that. He's going to college. So because I thought I could get drafted, I went to a junior college in Georgia for two years called Middle Georgia Junior College. And during those two years, I still couldn't catch because my foot was still, you know, it wasn't healed all the way. So I played the outfield and I did in, in uh, third base. Then I ended up, so I, I, those two years, I didn't get drafted. I went to the University of Kentucky uh, because it was the closest thing to my mom and dad. And I the figured, choice. yep, and I figured, you know, I, I'm going to get drafted probably by, after my junior year uh, from Kentucky. And I might as well you know, be close to home and let my parents watch me play. Went to Kentucky, had a great year. Again, didn't get drafted, but I still had not gone back behind the plate. So I, this, a buddy of mine, my roommate in college, played out in the Jayhawk League in Kansas and said, you know, why don't you come spend a summer out with me? Let's have some fun and we'll play ball. So I said, okay, I'll come out there. So I went out to Kansas, but I told the coach I wanted to catch. And so I was catching a little bit more. Uh, and the, Yankee, the New York Yankees saw me catching. And the scout came up to me and said, hey, what are you doing catching? I said, well, I can catch. I just haven't had the opportunity. Right. And he said, if you can, you know, I just saw you catch five days in a row. We want to sign you. Because <laughs> well, no one catches five days in a row. No yeah. one does that. <laughs> well, and especially if you have a bad foot. Right. Yeah. So he said, we want to sign you. So I called my dad up, said, Dad, I need you to get on a plane, come to Kansas. These guys want to sign me. Between them, and it was between them and the Kansas City Royals. Oh. And the only reason we chose the New York Yankees is they were both offering $8,000 as a signing bonus. But, they, but the New York Yankees were the only one that would guarantee if I wanted to go back to college and get my education, they would pay for it. See, that is a smart move. And I think we're seeing that a lot more often now with major league teams. I think there's uh, – I mean, you might know, but correct me if I'm wrong. I think there's some sort of clause if you can make in your contract coming out of high school – that if there is some sort of injury, if it derails your career before you make it to the show, they pay for your education going to college. Is that correct? Yeah. Matter of fact, you can get that put in on your bonus. It's just saying, listen, even if it's after my career, wow. if, I, if, if I want 200 grand to go to college, you, you'll handle 200 grand to go to college. That's fantastic. And, yeah. So it, I tell people, all, parents all the time, you know, that, that call me up and say, hey, listen, my kid might be drafted. What do you think? And I said, listen, if you can get his education paid for and get close to a million dollar signing bonus, take the chance. Yeah, yeah take, take the chance. Take it. Absolutely. So after the 1985 season with the Wildcats, you went on draft, like you said before. You signed by the Yankees. And, and then five years later, on June 8th, 1990, you make your major league debut against the Baltimore Orioles. And at the time, one of my favorite players is, Bill, is uh, Cal Ripken Jr. At shortstop, this team is pretty good. The Yankees in the, in the early 90s, not so great. But you had the opportunity to, to play. You did a pitch hit RBI single to left field. Take me through that at bat and 
what does that mean to you coming from a guy that um coming from a guy that is um an undrafted guy and then give him the chance to make your major league debut yeah well you know what it was we were playing we were playing the night before in triple a in toledo and i went 0 for 6 in a doubleheader was throwing my helmet was really ticked off and Rick Downs called me in the office. He was our manager at AAA at that time. Sure. And he calls me in the office and he says, sit down. And I'm like, uh-oh, I'm going to get an I'm gonna ask you in right here. Uh, and he said, and so he says, just wait a minute. And he walked out. And I'm sitting there going, okay, what's, what's going on? And he brings Alan Mills into, my, into the office. And he said, hey, listen, it's the first time I've ever had done this in my life, my career, but – the Gene Michael just called me and, you know, Mr. Steinbrenner suspended and they right, want to give you two an opportunity. They haven't done it in a long time. Two young kids from the farm system, a chance to, to see if we can start building from within. And he said, you guys just got caught up to the big leagues. And I was like, this is awesome. You know, I looked at Alan, I said, oh my God, this is awesome, dude. We made it. Yes. Yeah, it, it, and it was like 1 a.m. in the morning. Oh my God, it's crazy. And we were in Toledo. So we, you know, our triple A team was in Columbus. So we had about a three hour drive back. And so on the drive back, I called my parents up and I said, you know, dad, and he's like, he's half asleep. It's two o'clock in the morning. Right. He's like, what are you doing calling me this late? I say, Hey, I got just, I just got called up to the big leagues. He's like, what? Call me in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have time for that. Exactly. So then I picked up the phone and called my wife who was in Columbus and said, Hey, just got caught up to the big leagues coming home. I'll be home in another hour or two. Uh, I've got to go to New York. I've got to go to Baltimore tomorrow. Wow. And yeah. And sure enough, Alan and I get on a plane the next day. We get into Baltimore right around three o'clock. We miss batting practice. We get there and we get our uniforms and, you know, we meet everybody and, you know, it was, it was pretty cool. And, uh, had no clue that we would ever get in the game. You know, we were just kind of taking it in. And about the sixth inning, Buck Showalter came up to me. He was one of the coaches back then. Came up to me and said, hey, you may want to get ready to hit because Stump loves to throw guys right into the fire. So I, I went in the locker room. I started stretching, getting loose. And sure enough, I think we were down two to one. And I see Greg Olson, who was Baltimore's closer at the time, warming up. Right-handed pitcher, I'm like, I got no chance to get in this game. You know, they're not going to put me up against a right-hander. And at that time – coming in right. Yep. And at that time, Greg Olson was 13 for 13 in saves. You know, he was one of the best closers in the league at that time. So, sure enough, eighth inning comes and – they uh, or, sorry, the top of the ninth inning comes. And, you know, I, I come out of the, the, the locker room and I'm waiting and I'm deck with my batting gloves. And all of a sudden, Stump goes, hey, you're going to hit for Tolleson. Well, Tolleson was the fourth hitter. First two guys get out. So now I go up on deck and Steve Sachs is batting. And he gets on, he gets on, I think he got on in the air. And so now I come to bat and I'm facing Greg Olson. Never faced him before. I couldn't, I wasn't in the meetings before the game because we missed BP. So I didn't know what kind of pitches he had, what he threw. He throws me, you know, he has that nasty breaking ball was his key pitch. He throws that first pitch to me. I swing at it. It bounces about 10 feet in front of home plate. Steve Sachs goes to second base. And there's the opportunity. So then he throws me another breaking ball. <laughs> Again, I swing at it 55 feet. 0-2. Uh, he wastes a fastball. High, he threw a fastball high to waste. And then he came back with another curveball. But this time I, I hit it pretty good, but down a right field line foul. And I got a little confidence going, hey. I could hit that pitch. And sure enough, the next pitch, he hung it. I got a base hit. Sack scored. We tied the game up. I'm in seventh heaven, first at bat, first at RBI, you know, off Greg Olson. Randy Milligan got me the ball at first base. There you go. And uh, then we go out the next inning, and I'm playing third base. They load the bases with one out. And I make a great diving play. But I get up, and I throw the ball to home plate, and I short out Matt Noakes. He misses it. We lose the game. And so I get the best of both worlds in my first big league game. I mean, you can't get better than that. It's, it's, it's honestly for you at the time must have been a great learning experience to 
never get too high because you can come pretty low in a matter of seconds. And that I think that might have been great for you as a first – your debut had been great because it's, it, you learned. You learned that you can't – you know, you can't – look, you can go four for four, but if you make two errors and you lose the game, then that four for four is erased. Well, especially when you play in New York, you know. Ex- I, I, absolutely. I got my first taste of New York. and you know, I wasn't a Yankee fan growing up. I grew up with the Big Red Machine back in the 70s. Pete Rose, Johnny Bench, those guys were my idols. Right. Um, I got to be a bad boy with them, so I got to know them personally. Wow. It was really a great time. So I didn't know much about the Yankees. But in double A, Dave Island and I and Bobby Green and a couple other guys drove down. We were playing in Albany on an off day, and we drove down to Yankee Stadium for a game, just a you know, very first time ever going into Yankee Stadium, sitting behind home plate. Mm-hmm. Now at that time, that was night. This is 1988. Don Mattingly is the man. The man. Right? Yeah. So we come down and we're sitting behind home plate and we're watching the game and they got 35,000 people there. And Mattingly comes up the first time and they're all screaming, yay, get him, Cap. And they're all, you know, first time up, he hits a double in the gap. They're all cheering him. And we're like, we're all looking at each other going, dude, this is going to be so cool if we ever get a chance to play here. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. And then sure enough, the next time Madani comes to bat, men on second and third, you're down by a run. He strikes out. And, dude, I'm telling you, every cuss word I've ever heard in my entire life. You suck, Mattingly. You're the worst. And all of a sudden, these guys look at me and they're going, holy crap, dude. If they're booing him, we got no chance. (laughs) They're going to destroy us. (laughs) So I knew. Oh, my God. I knew going into when I got called up what I was getting into. Oh my God. See that, I mean, and that's even better. It, you're this minor leaguer that's tr- working his ass off to get there. And you're like, do I even want to play for them? Like, I don't even want to know. <laughs> right. <laughs> do I want to? Well, I mean, you told this awesome Don Manley story you played with throughout your career. I mean, I looked up the rosters you played on, man, you play with just about every kind of personality you played with. I- I'm going to write off some names here. You play, of course, with Jeter. Uh, Deion Sanders, Rivera, Clemens, Jim Edmonds, Eddie Murray, Pudge. Um, hold on, I got a long list here. Uh, Nomar Garcia Para, Eckersley, Pedro Martinez, Tony freaking Gwen, Kevin Brown, Hoffman, Sheffield, our young Eric Gagne. Is there any particular story from any of those guys I rattled off that can be the number one story that you'd like to share? Because I, I mean, I've heard, we've all heard the Deion stories from football. Not many people remember him as playing baseball, but I know this. I know that you know Pedro was a you know, of course, a wild card as well. But I, I love to hear these stories from guys like you talking about playing with these Hall of Famers. Well, yeah, you know, I was lucky enough that you know most of the teams that I joined were teams that were either going to the playoffs or had a chance at the playoffs. Especially later in my career, after I left the Yankees in '96, uh, and yeah, I got a chance to play. For me, because I was a hitter first, you know, defensive player second. Um, my biggest thrill, I always tell Ben, I got to play with four of the greatest hitters of that era, you know, that I played in, uh, Don Mattingly, Wade Boggs, Tony Gwynn, and, um, you know, those three plus watching Edgar Martinez during that time going up against him. Uh, and then of course, to me, the greatest hitter of all those, those four, the fifth one, made the game look like he was playing Atari and that was Barry Bonds. Um, right. You know, but, but to be in the hitting groups with Wade Boggs and Tony Gwynn and Don Mattingly, I learned so much from those guys, uh, how to approach hitting, how to do different, different things. It, it, it was such a thrill and an honor for me to be able to be, be, you know, to be in those groups with those guys and to not only share playoff experiences and world series experiences with them, but, you know, winning two World Series and then losing one. And even though we lost in San Diego, we got approval for the new stadium for Petco Park because of that That's 98 awesome. team. Right. And if we don't have that kind of postseason in 98, I don't think the Padres get approval for that stadium. And look what that did and what that's done for the San Diego Padres. So to be a part of 96, the beginning of the dynasty, and to be part of the 98 Padres that brought in that new stadium, uh, as a kid, as a guy that was never drafted, was a right. part-time player, but had, had an integral role 
in the 96 team and the 98 team in San Diego. I've been very blessed with uh, with having those opportunities. You talk about the San Diego Padres 98 team. You had some boppers in that team. I mean, the one that comes to mind is Ken Caminetti. That guy just would hit missiles out of the park. But you had some insight other than, than your other teammates. You won 96 with the Yankees. And then this 98 team, which was arguably the greatest of all time, was there any sort of insight that you had, like an inside track to helping try to help your Padres team win? Or was it just this team, this Yankee team was like too damn good? Well, you know what it was, was, you know, it was completely different. You know, there's nothing like playing in New York and the pressure, the fans back in that old stadium, People were afraid to go there and play. The visiting because it would be rocking. It'd be rocking. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember Jeff Nelson telling me a story that he couldn't even warm up in the Seattle bullpen in '95 because they were just dousing him with beer <laughs> right and left. And when he asked the security guard to help, he goes, "Hey, I'm a Yankee fan. I ain't helping." See you later. <laughs> you know? But but uh, when we came in, I try to explain to them, "Don't get intimidated by the fans. Don't get intimidated." And you know what? Up until that 2-2 pitch to Tino Martinez, I think we, uh, I think we felt like we had a chance. Hmm. And unfortunately, that 2-2 pitch was called a ball, and the next pitch from Langston was a three, was a, a grand slam. Yeah. Uh, I think I kind of felt our whole locker room go, holy crap, these guys are destined to win this thing. And then, of course, we went out the next day, and Andy Ashby – you know, was, was battling food poisoning and didn't give us a very good performance. And then one thing snowballed after another. Then we thought we still had a chance going back to San Diego. And then, of course, Brocious hits the big home run off Trevor Hoffman, who's our Mariano Rivera. You know, Right. And it, it just seemed like everything was going right for them, even if they, you guys put up the, the, best, pl- pl- the yeah. best pitcher in the National League, yep. arguably – and Trevor Hoffman, and then it just seemed like, you know what, you could put freaking Jesus Christ out there. It's not – we're still going to hit home runs, you know? Yeah, yeah. that, that 96 – or that 98 team with them, you know, you look back on that and, you know, it, it was one of the greatest in history. And even though – I always tell people this, even though we got swept in San Diego, we still had a parade. So <laughs> – Really? I didn't know that. That's, yeah, that's how much – that team met to the people in San Diego. And like I said, that's why they got approval for that park. Uh, because even though, you know, because people always said to me, would this happen in New York? I said, absolutely not. No. No. You didn't go out of your house for two weeks when you lost the World Series in New York. Right. Um, so let's, let's talk about your two big Yankee moments. And arguably the biggest moments in like Yankee history that's up for debate. In game two, 1995 American League Division Series against the Seattle Mariners. That Mariners team, pretty damn good. Really, really young. You had Junior, of course, everyone knows that. A young A-Rod, Buner, Martinez, and then they had Randy Johnson. And then you had, like, you know, other role players as well. But the conditions of that game you were in, it was rainy. It wasn't good. It w- wasn't the most, like, I guess, enjoyable game to play in. But you had Catch a walk off. Catch all 15 innings, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, to get all 15 long innings going in New York. It's raining. It's not fun. 15th inning, you hit this walk-off two-run home run. Take me back to that game and your approach going into that at bat. Well, yeah, you know, I I caught all 15 innings. That's amazing. Uh, And I think it was in the 12th inning I came up with Donnie on second, Mattingly on second, and um, had a chance to drive in what would have been the winning run. And I hit my, I had a 3-1 pitch or 3-0 pitch. No, I'm sorry, 2-0 pitch that I grounded back to Melcher at the time. Um, and uh, came in and was breaking my bat in the tunnel and, you know, go, going nuts. And sure. David Cohn coming down the tunnel stopped for a second. He looked at me and he goes, dude, that's impressive. You've caught every, all 12 innings <laughs> and you still have that kind of energy. Get back out there. You're going to get another chance. So, oh, you know. Cool. Yeah, so we went back out, and then, then I come up in the 15th inning, and I'm standing in the dugout, and Showalter comes up to me, and he goes, hey, this is going to be your last at bat. You've caught all 15 innings. Mike Stanley's going to come in and catch after this. And I, he goes, make this at bat count. And sure enough, Pat Kelly gets on on a walk. I come up, 3-1 pitch from Belcher. I hit a, 
a two run walk off. And I tell kids when I when I speak to kids and I talk about these moments to these kids, I said I, I learned a very valuable lesson that night, later on that series, is that even though to this day that walk off home run in Yankee Stadium is my greatest memory, greatest moment that I've ever had as a ball player. Because we didn't go on to win that World Series, that home run became a footnote. Right. And even though my home run, and as you're gonna talk about next in 96, even though that home run was, you know, be became the biggest home run I ever hit, it only tied the game up, but it became more important because we won the game and we won the series. So I tell kids all the time, it's important to have individual feats and memories, but those don't mean anything unless the team wins. And because our team won in 96, I know you want to talk about the 96 home run, uh, that, that home run became even more important because the team won. No, and that's a really good point because I feel like that's why people like the 96 one more than the 95 one. But to stick with 95, game five, of course, like you just mentioned before, Martinez hits the single, the the single or double, whatever you want to call it, to left field, and Junior scores the famous call from Dave Newhouse, and he slides in right in front of you, right? Yep. Moment that happens, you're walking down. I'm sure you're walking in the tunnel. You guys are all pissed off, you know, understandable. Was there a moment though when you said after the game that we'll be back because I know how good this team is, and in '96 you were like ten times better than you what you were in '95. Yeah, I think we all had the experience. You know, it, it was the whole season in 95 was because we all knew that was Donnie's last year. That whole season's goal was let's just get Donnie to the playoffs. And we got there, and it was the first time for all of us. And we got a taste of it. And because, you know, even though we lost that series, we didn't give it up. They beat us. You know, they earned it. And it was such a great experience for everybody. I mean, we, it was so funny because we were actually kind of celebrating a little bit in the locker room after we got over the, the initial shock right. of losing. You know, and, and Buck made the speech and said, hey, you guys did this. We got this far. Next year, we're going to go further. We all kind of felt pretty good about what we accomplished. But then we all got out of the locker room and we saw all the wives and they're all crying and they're all upset. And they're like, oh, my God, this is so terrible. And we're like, it really isn't that bad. You know, and uh, the whole ride home, you know, the flight home from Seattle, we talked about, hey, we're going to be ready to go next year. And then sure enough, a few changes made. Unfortunately, we knew Donnie was going to retire. Yes. Uh, you, you know, and so we pick up Joe Torre now as a new manager, you know, Tito Martinez, Jeff Nelson. We have some changes that are going on. But the core of that group that experienced that playoffs, we were around and we were ready to go starting 96. To get, get, to get more of a taste of the playoffs. So this 96 season, you guys absolutely blow it out of the water. Joe Torre at the time was a manager that really didn't have a lot of success. And it was, um, I would say, a risk from the Steinrunners to hire Torre, but he proved a lot of people wrong. So going into this game, this is my like top, one of my top five favorite moments of all time in Yankee history. Game four, 96 World Series, you're at the plate against Mark Wallers. For the people at home that don't know who this guy is, this guy was really, really good through the, the Braves dynasty run in their early 90s. That's when the, they were the best. I mean, this Braves team had the three-headed monster in the rotation with Smoltz, Glavin, and, um, and Maddox. And then they had Jones and the other Jones and Javi Lopez, and this team was deep. This at bat, I broke it down. First, before we break it down by pitch, what was your approach going into the bat? Because Wallers was his all-star. 303 ERA, 39 saves in that 96 season. So what was the approach going in? Well, yeah, I mean, he was there, Mariano Rivera. You know, he was he got right. the last out of the 95 World Series. Um, that, that was the Braves' only World Series championship. Um, so, you know, but I always say this. Sometimes ignorance is bliss hmm. because m most of the time, you know, we would sit in meetings before the game. Well, I, on this particular game – we had never played interleague before. And back in those days, if you weren't in the lineup in an American League game, you pretty much, there was no pinch hitting. You know, you had nine strong hitters because you had a DH. You know, there was no double switches. There were no, 
pinch hitting and stuff like that going on. And so the first two innings of that game, I was just kind of sitting in the locker room in a shorts and a t-shirt, kind of just, you know, taking my time. And, you know, you know, and then all of a sudden Gary Tuck, our catching coach came in and he goes, Hey, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm going to, I'll be ready. Like I'm going to go out now. I'm watching the game. I'll go out next inning and get on the bench. And he goes, no, dude, you can, there's double switches in this game. There's pinch hitting early for the pitcher. Kenny Rogers is pitching. He might get an early hook and you may have to hit early. And he's like, you need to go get ready. So I jumped in the shower, got ready, you know, and, and went on the bench. By the time I got to the bench, we were down six, nothing. Thought, you know, looking at Pat Kelly and looking at other, other guys going, man, at least we didn't get swept, you know. And, uh, you know, so as the game progressed, Joe Torrey's going up and down the, the dugout going, hey, let's just chip away. Let's just chip away. And sure enough, in, the, in I think it was the sixth inning, we chipped away. We got three runs back. But then he pinch hits O'Neal for Girardi with, with, uh, with two men on. And O'Neal strikes out. And then Tino comes up. He strikes out, and we're like, oh, you know, there was our chance. And then sure enough, the lucky comes out the seventh inning. We don't put up any runs in the seventh inning. And at the beginning, at the end of the seventh inning, if you remember, Mark Wohler started warming up. Mm -hmm. And I remember looking at Pat Kelly right before I went out to catch the bottom of the seventh going, all right, well, again, let, thank God we didn't get swept. Look, Wohler's is warming up. They're going for the, they're going for the jugular. And so I went out, caught the bottom of the seventh, came back in, and I looked at uh, uh, Chris Chambliss. I said, hey, what's this guy got? Chambliss goes, hey, he throws 100 miles an hour. Yeah, <laughs> just about it. <laughs> I'm standing next to Strawberry in the, in, the, in, the, in the dugout, and I go, Straw, I only have two bats left. I got to catch tomorrow with Smoltz pitching. And he broke one of my bats in game one. You know, can I, can I borrow one of yours? And he's like, and he had a brand new box of Mizuno bats. And he's like, yeah, go ahead and take one of my new ones. So I took one of his new bats, got pine tarted up, and went out there. And I looked at Zim, and I go, Zim, can you give me any more information? Chambliss just said this guy throws hard. He goes, Jimmy, he throws 100. Just get ready. And so, <laughs> so I went out the on deck circle. Yeah. And sure enough, Mariano, or Mariano Duncan hits that ground ball. Looks like it's going to be a double play, but they don't turn the double play. So in my mind, I was like, okay, all I got to do is hit a fly ball to get a sacrifice fly to get that one run in to get us closer, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to get one guy on and have a chance to hit a home run to tie it up in the ninth inning. So, going, you know, sure enough, I come up to that at bat. Now, I didn't really study rollers, mm -hmm. didn't know much besides 100 miles an hour. So he throws me that first fastball, 99 or 98. Correct. It was it was a ninety eight, yeah. and you fouled it off straight back. So you were uh, right on it. Yep. And and then but, the next, right, right. According to theory, I was right on it. According to where the ball made contact with my bat, you I right wasn't on. because when I looked at the bat, again, it was the first time using it. When I looked at the bat, the, the I found that ball, even though it went in straight back, on the barrel of the ball, the bat. Oh wow. Yeah. So, but but rollers didn't see that. I can only see that. Right. So sure enough, he throws me two sliders the next two pitches. Correct. And both of them are balls. Yeah, he threw the the first one was high in a way, and then the second one was high again. So yeah. he's I don't know what your your um I guess approach was in ninety six. Was were you a guy to 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 swing at a lot of balls outside? Were you like were you the guy to chase a lot or no? No, I, I stood off the plate a lot, so I would take right. a fastball in. And I would always look out over the plate. So my power was to right center uh, on a fastball, you know, left center on, on a breaking ball because I usually stayed out over the plate. And so what happened was it, it always looked like to the pitcher that they could throw a good pitch on the outside corner and get me. And uh, so I think he went with two sliders to try to, see, try to get me. And, of course, he tried to overthrow them. And then I'm, if you remember the broadcast, Tim McCarver's with Joe Buck. And Tim McCarver, after the second slider, said, I think Lowers is going to the slider too much. Right. He says these are the most sliders he's ever thrown in his, in his entire life. Yeah, and that so fourth they, pitch, he throws that fastball at 99, and you foul it off to the right side. Yeah. So now, since now you're telling me your, your go-to area is right center, 
this is you're like all right i'm ready to go now throw that again outside see what happens right he throws another slider outside for a ball and then the sixth pitch he gives you an 86 mile an hour hanging slider and if you look back in the replay replay javi lopez is set up way outside and like, eddie perez eddie perez Oh, Eddie Perez, excuse me, I forgot he wasn't starting that game. Yeah, Eddie Perez was, was set up way outside. And to, like, the chalk of, like, the left-hander's batter's box, like, that far yeah. out. And then it was, it was a hanger middle away, in a way, and you pulled it to left field. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, he threw me the 2-2 first pitch slider that I just barely fouled off. And in my mind – I, I took a half a step back off the plate because in my mind, I was like, as a catcher, I'm going, okay, next pitch. If I'm the catcher, I'm throwing fastball in right here because you're not catching up to a 100 mile an hour fastball inside. And as I followed that 2 2 slider off, Tim McCarver said again, all right, Wohlers is going to throw 100, you know. And sure enough, he did go back. He came back with the slider. John Smoltz tells the story because he was in there charting pitches watching from you know, the home plate angle. And he sees Eddie Perez put down fastball and Waller shakes to the slider. And Smoltz is yelling, he says, I'm yelling at the TV, no, no, no. And sure enough, Waller does hang the slider. I was a little bit out in front because uh, I was looking fastball too, uh, but I was able to keep my hands back. And you know, Atlanta was a launching pad. And when I hit it, uh, I knew that I, I knew that it was get, it was getting out. That's amazing. And then in game five, you caught for Pettit. He dominated one of his best performances of his career. Eight and a third innings pitch, three walks, four Ks. You guys end up getting the win, and then you follow the next game, winning the World Series in New York. Yeah, um, that game five. That game was, five. Yeah. Um, you know, Andy and I talked about it right before game five, and he. He came up and we, you know, we sit down before the, the game and we go over the hitters. And I said, well, let's just don't do what we did game one, you know, because we got killed in game one. Right. Um, and he goes, yeah, but I want to thank you because by hitting that home run last night, you took away a lot of pressure off me that this is not an elimination game, that I can go out there and just do my best. And sure enough, you know, he was able to do that in that game five. And I tell people all the time, the home run that I hit was great. But catching that entire game five and that game was probably the best and biggest game I've ever played in in my entire career because huh. that's what led us to winning that World Series. Why were you Andy Pettit's personal catcher? What was the, what was the relationship from 95 to 96 and then you came back in 99 2000? So what was yeah, the relationship you know, there? It, it's like it's one man's, you know, one man's loss is another man's gain. Because he didn't, he wasn't comfortable pitching to Mike Stanley in '95. That I was the other catcher by default, right. and he wanted to throw to me because I always called his bullpens. I never caught him in the game, and he loved the way that I would catch him in the bullpen. And so he went to Showalter and said, "Hey, can you just give Jimmy a shot?" And sure enough, our first game, I think we won three to one, and the rest of that season we went nine and three together, and we just gelled. And I think Andy had a lot of confidence that. I was such a great hitter or good hitter right. that I, I thought like a hitter first and Andy loved oh. that and had confidence in me that, that I put down the right numbers and he never shook off. Like I will tell you out of the 80, hundred games I caught with him, if he shook me more than two times a game, it was a lot. And wow. because he had number one, he had confidence in all four pitches, but also he had the confidence in me as a, as a hitter first, catcher second, that I knew how to call the game. That's really interesting. And I, I really saw um, my first hand of kind of understanding the game as I've gotten older that, like, A.J. Burnett's guy was Jose Molina. Yeah. That, that was it. And there was, I guess, early on in that 09 season and throughout Burnett's time with the Yankees, people were wondering, like, is, are, you know, Burnett and Posada not friends? Are they arguing? Do they not get along? No, it's just – if a guy gels with somebody, you know, don't mess it up. And I, and now yeah. from what you're saying, that's how it worked with you and Pettit. Yeah. I mean, there's no reason why. I mean, Andy, Andy and I at that time were complete opposites. 
You know, I'm more like Andy now because I am a God-driven man more than I was during my playing days. But Andy was a God-driven, good Christian kid. I was the guy that was out in New York at night with the cowboy hat and the cowboy boots. And, you know, we were completely opposite personalities. Um, but I always say this is what my dad taught me about Pete Rose when I idolized Pete Rose. But my dad knew all the stuff off the field about Pete. My dad said, idolize the player for what he does between the lines. And that's kind of how Andy and I gelled. But Andy didn't give a crap what I did. He knew when I was between the lines that all I thought about was winning, 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 and being the best that we could possibly be. And I think that's why he had the confidence thrown to me. But, yeah, we were complete opposites as far as personalities. And Tim McCarver will tell you the same thing. Him and Steve Carlton were complete opposites. But yet something gelled. And, uh, you know, you had McCarver, you know, you had um, Greg Maddox never liked to throw to Javi Lopez. He liked to throw to Eddie Perez better. There, there are certain combinations that sometimes guys just click. And if the backup catcher is good enough, you can give him that opportunity. And that's what happened. Um, yeah. And I like how you mentioned Pete Rose that one time for uh, just a second ago. He had himself a, a, a different stance than others. He was a hunched over guy. Your batting stance has to be in the top 10, 15 ones that people say a little different than others. I mean, the Craig councils of the world, the Sheffields, those are the ones that everyone really knows are the kind of wacky ones, but yours, the hand up twirl and your front leg is kind of bent straight and you're way out. You, you're far outside the right hander's batter's box. Where in the world did you get this batting stance from? Well, as you just explained it in high school, I wore number 14, Pete Rose. I batted like Pete Rose, so I used to get in that little crouch and lean back. And I was a kind of a singles double line drive hitter, just like Pete was. I, I struck out twice my entire senior year. Oh my okay? God. I, yeah, I didn't like, I, out of 100 at bats, I was, I was 48 for 100 with two punch outs, that's it. Um, but I hit more like Pete Rose. And so I leaned back, you know, on my, on my thing, just like Pete did. But then, when I broke my leg four days before the draft, and the scout said to my dad, listen, we'll come back and watch him play at the end of the summer. If he's healthy, you know, maybe we'll give him a, an opportunity. Well, I you know, was so used to hitting that way on my back leg that the only way I could take batting practice to stay in shape to make sure that I get a chance maybe to get signed was to take batting practice with a cast on my left leg. So if you think about it, I couldn't put pressure on that left foot in order to hit. So I, I still laid on my back foot, but I put my, I, I had my front leg stiff and I just took batting practice every day. And all of a sudden I just became comfortable. And that's how, the, that's how that stance came about, was just because I couldn't put pressure on the cast and I had to just, wow. yeah, I had to stay back. So I tell people all the time when, you know, Shane Hillebrand just reached out to me the other day and said, we were talking, I was wishing him a happy anniversary, just like we were. And I, he goes, I always wanted to hit like you. And I go, yeah, you know, it's funny. I teach lessons sometimes to kids. And the parents are like, can you teach my kid how to hit like me? I go, well, you don't know the story, but you might have to break your kid's leg if you want him to hit like me. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Did anybody, did any of your hitters, did any of your hitting coaches ever tell you, um, you we should change this because it doesn't seem to be normal? Has, has anybody yeah. said that? Um, yeah, you know what? I, I, I got to move real quick. My wife needs the computer, but sure, go right ahead. Hold on, All right, we'll go into here. So yeah, as a matter of fact, it's funny because you know in the minor leagues, um, I led the I led the the league in hitting ball and double A, and when I got the double A, actually the the first year of double A, um, Darren Johnson was our hitting coach. And um, I think I hit, I hit 307. I led the Fort Lauderdale, the, the, the Fort Lauderdale A-ball league in hitting. And we got to double A and Darren Johnson wanted me to hit with more power. Hmm. And I said, well, you know, and he, had, and he had me hit like Eric Davis. You remember Eric Davis used to keep the hands really low yeah. and, you know, and just try to jack the ball every time. Right. And I wasn't comfortable doing it, but, you know, he was my coach. I had to listen to him. Um, and so I tried it, and I was getting frustrated and getting more frustrated and wound up hitting 254. 
Oh my uh, God. And, you know, I, I think I only hit five home runs in 1988. And I said, you know what? It came back to spring training in 89 and said, I don't care. You want to cut me? You want to get rid of me? I'm hitting like I want to hit. And sure enough, in 89, I went back to hitting the way I used to hit. And I led the league in hitting, hit 10 home runs, you know, and I still had a little bit of power, but I, w- I was still hitting for average. Uh, and I stayed with that from, from that entire time on. But yeah, that was the one time somebody tried to change my hitting. Jeez, it's, look, I mean, I- I've, I've had my stance altered my entire life. And I always have said to coaches like, hey, look, if it doesn't look the way you want it to look, or it might not, you might not think it's working, but it's working for me. Leave me alone. My, my, my best hitting coach was Rod Carew. Rod was my, I mean, he, he was down here. Well, and here's what he said to me. When I came over in 97, you know, after 96, I came to the Angels in 97. He came up and he said, listen, I'm not, I don't teach mechanics. He said, I had a different stance for every pitcher I faced. I don't expect you guys to be able to do that. Right. But he goes, I will teach you how to set up a pitcher, how to work the count, how to look for certain pitches in certain counts. I will teach you the mental side of baseball, probably something you've never had before. And I said, yeah, you know, you know uh, Chris Chambliss and Rick Downs, they used to just tell me, Jimmy, swing as hard as you can and keep your shoulder in. They didn't mess with my stance too much. And, uh, but Rod Carew used to, was one of the first coaches, I believe, back in 97, to start using video. And he would have a stream of video running through the clubhouse on that, that day's starting pitcher, uh, you know, who, we were, who we were facing. Right. A continuous stream running and just showing us how this pitcher threw, pick up angles, pick up arm angles, pick up different things, and continually just reinforce picking up pitches. And it was so helpful and such a different way to approach hitting than I ever had before. And uh, I think it really made me – you know, that, that much better. And our angel team, a much better hitting team because that, that was the way Rod was teaching us. See, that's not something I never even heard of. I've always wondered where did the video aspect of, of the next store, you know, sort of scouting and, yeah. and scouting reports come from. And well, now I, I would have guessed probably anybody else, but Rod Carew makes a lot of sense being one of the best hitters ever. Now, lastly, I want to talk about your charitable, charitable work. You are a spokesman for pink tie. And you've worked with Friends of Karen, which my mom is a part of the board. Um, you've met her. You've done a lot of the, 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 the charity works with, with them. Tell me about Pink Tie. Well, you know, as, as a ball player back in the day, uh, I had an opportunity back in 96 um, to sponsor two little boys um, that were looking for a father, but also wanted to go to a Yankee game. And long story short, I took these boys to a Yankee game to give – at that time, it was the adoption month in June, and Nick Scarpetta was the head of children's services. He asked me if I could help them start a charity and get some publicity going for it. And so I said, yeah, you know what? I'd love to do that. And at the end of that, that was a season I, of course, hit the home run in 96. That year, they got adopted into a family. And I realized just something little like that, doing for something else, you could really help other people. Um, and then fast forward to my career being over, going through some hard times, uh, coming back from those hard times. I met Mike Cave and Rich Cave, who owned a company, a title company called First Equity, but they had a charity called Pink Tie. And their charity, they were probably three or four years into the charity. They were looking for a spokesperson. And they met me and they said, listen, we're trying to help all different charities and foundations that need financial help. That's how I met, you know, you from, from, from friends of Karen, that's how I met her. Um, so they said, we want you to be the spokesperson. So I started that and to learn about their charity, to learn about not just working for one, but to help all different types of charities and foundations. I've been so blessed to be a part of that. Uh, they've allowed me to help also do the work for a title company to make, make some money to be able to give me the opportunity to do all these events. I think I do close to 30 to 40 events every year. That's fantastic. Friends. And uh, it's been a blessing for me. Uh, I've always said that, you know, when I, when I moved uh, on after my baseball career, that if I could do something to that, I can make some money, but I can help a lot of people and have a lot of fun, uh, that I'd have that opportunity. And 
uh, Mike Cave and Rich Cave gave me that opportunity with Pink Tie. And uh, it's been, we've been doing it now for five and a half years together. And it's once this virus is over with and once I can travel again, we'll get back to doing those events. And uh, I'll be out there on Long Island in New York and in New York City and uh, doing those things again. But yeah, that, that was really such a blessing for me uh, to be able to, to, to be a part of that organization. That's fantastic. I mean, the, the that's what's really hurting a big time. I think during this this pandemic is all these charity events that people don't even think of that are are getting canceled. I mean, there was a gala for Friends of Karen in mid March that yeah. was supposed to raise tens of thousands of dollars is now been moved to the summer, but we don't even know if we're going to be back to nor being being normal by summer. I mean, we're looking at May, June. I mean, yeah. we can't even see what the real starting date is because nobody knows. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, for me in the same situation, you know, this is the first year that I was rehired by the Yankees to go back and work in the suites and, and do all that, which, you know, for the first time in two years that I, they, they brought me back. Uh, and now there probably won't even be a season. And even if there is, there's no chance that they're going to want, you know, sweet appearances and things like that that happen. Nobody's going uh, right. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be a, a big change. But, yeah, you know, like you said, the, the hardest people that are being hit, besides the frontline workers that we right. – you know, that, you know we're, we've been doing podcasts on Wednesdays and Saturdays uh, with my buddy of mine to raise money for all different, uh, different, different uh, hospitals uh, and organizations that are, need to be fed because uh, they don't have time to go get meals or, you know, go to a restaurant and get, you know, lunch – or even dinner. So we've, we've created a foundation, a, a GoFundMe, uh, that we do a show every Wednesday and every Saturday to, uh, to raise awareness, to raise money. We've raised, I think, almost $9,000 to, yeah, to feed the frontline workers. So if you're ever a bit bored and you wanna go on uh, seven o'clock to nine o'clock on Wednesdays and six to nine on Saturdays, go on to my Facebook, which is James J. Layeritz or J. Kobach, and we do a little podcast, a three-hour show. We, we bring out all different types of guests. We've had uh, Jeff Nelson, uh, Tanyan Sturtz, a lot of Yankee-centric. But this week on Wednesday, we're going to have uh, a Warren Sapp and Sean Landetta because we got the draft coming up on Thursday. And we're going to have some fun, but most of all, raise some money to the, the much-needed meals to supply these people that are on the front line in New York. That's fantastic stuff. Jim, I really appreciate you coming on. It was a pleasure. I learned a lot. I learned stuff that I didn't even learn. I've never even knew about. So I really appreciate you coming on my podcast and hopefully we can catch up at a friends of Karen event on Long Island, whenever this pandemic is over. Yes. Thank you for having me, Taylor. Appreciate it.